<laughs> Hi, friends. Today we're looking at the book of the Judges, and the year is 2024. Now, I'm your old pal, Papa Dale, your host, and this is the Jan Hus Institute of Biblical Studies. It's the Bachelor of Arts in Biblical Literature degree program. Because there's always new viewers, I'll introduce myself, but I'll be brief. I'm a retired pastor, teacher, theologian, and professor with over 50 years of service to the Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Dale Warren, and professionally I'm known in my writings, teachings, and lectures as D.A. Warren, but my friends just call me Papa Dale, so you can too. Now you can see the details of my personal testimony, family life, education, and ministry experience on other videos on this playlist. So for now, let's get right into today's topic, which is the book of Judges, part number one. Once again, this is part of the Bachelor of Arts in Biblical Literature degree program for the Jan Hus Institute. Put on my glasses and we'll make a start. The book of Judges is a gripping account of Israel's approximately 400-year turbulent history during the time between the conquest of Canaan and the establishment of the monarchy. This book reveals a cycle of sin, judgment, repentance, and deliverance among the people, which also revealed the sin nature of mankind, and it char characterized this entire era. Through the dramatic and vivid stories of various judges, leaders, and deliverers raised up by God, the book highlights both the faithfulness of God and the fickleness of his people. This lecture explores the book of Judges from an evangelical perspective to uncover its profound messages and lessons for today. So let's take a look at the authorship, who wrote the book of the Judges. From an evangelical point of view, several pieces of evidence are often cited to support the traditional view of authorship for the book of the Judges. The first piece of evidence is the historical context and literary style. While critics suggest that the style of writing and the historical context align more with that of the authors of other biblical texts, and they say this suggests that the text may have been written or compiled during an early phase of Israelite history by several contributors. Now, there are, there are apparent connections to other biblical books, but some evangelicals point out that the book of Judges is closely related to the book of Joshua, suggesting that the same author or group of editors may have worked on both texts, particularly given their content and themes regarding the conquest and settlement of Canaan. And to some degree there may be some truth to this, if it is this work on the text was divinely inspired and very likely occurred under the leadership of uh, one of the greatest prophets, priests, and scribes of all Israel's history, the uh, person of Ezra. Now, the understanding of Hebrew culture is important to the understanding of the book of the Judges. The author demonstrates a strong understanding of Hebrew culture, customs, and geography, and this implies that the author lived during or shortly after the events described, providing credibility to more traditional authorship views. That is, that the book was written more contemporary to the actual events. Point number four, the historical figures as possible authors. While some scholars propose that the prophet Samuel may have been the author or compiler, as he was a pivotal figure in Israel's history and involved in the transition from the judges to the monarchy. There may be some validity to that. Samuel may have participated in that. Point number five, covenantal themes. The book of Judges reflects themes important 
to the covenant relationship between God and Israel, which, evangelical scholars argue, could suggest an author who is well-versed in the theological implications of this relationship. Point number six, Jewish tradition. Evangelical belief regarding authorship follows closely with Jewish tradition that attributes the book of Judges to the prophet Samuel. Some suggest that it may have been written or compiled by multiple authors over time, particularly during the period of the monarchy, for example, the reign of Saul or David. And this might have been as a way to reflect on the need for strong leadership and the consequences of disobedience to God. Now, this notion of post-monarchic reflection is supported by the thematic focus on the problems that arose in Israel during a lack of centralized governance, which could be seen as a critique to guide future generations. Thus, while the precise authorship remains uncertain, the internal evidence provides significant support for the traditional position. Point number seven, divine inspiration. From an evangelical theological standpoint, believers hold the concept of divine inspiration, asserting that the Bible, the whole of the Bible, including the book of the Judges, is written under divine guidance, regardless of the specific human authors involved. And of course, this receives great affirmation by Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth affirmed the inspiration of scriptures, which at the time primarily referred to the Hebrew Bible, which we call the Old Testament. He often quoted from these books and indicated their authority by saying phrases like, It is written, or Have you not read? For example, see quotations of Jesus in Matthew 4.4 4, and again Matthew 22.29. Jesus acknowledged the scriptures as the word of God, attributing their origin to Yahweh. In his teachings, Jesus emphasized the authority and importance of the law and the prophets, demonstrating a deep respect for the scriptures as divinely inspired. This is evident in various passages where he refers to specific verses or teachings from the Old Testament, to illustrate his points or validate his actions. This emphasis on the authority of Scripture continues to be a foundational belief within Christianity, particularly in evangelical circles, and includes the Book of Judges. Overall, while specific authorship of Judges is debated, these points are commonly cited among evangelicals to support the traditional view regarding the authorship of this biblical book. So, how does modern archaeology impact the historicity and our attitudes toward the book of the Judges? Well, it goes like this. Archaeological evidence related to the historicity of the book of Judges is complex and often debated among scholars. While there is no definitive pardon me, while there is no definitive archaeological proof that directly confirms every event or figure mentioned in Judges, several findings have been interpreted to support its accounts in various ways. Some of these findings are one, the settlement patterns of the Israelites as they settled in the land. Archaeological studies of ancient Israelite settlements during the late Bronze Age and early Iron Age have provided agreement with insights into the period depicted in the Judges. Evidence of destructive layers in certain cities aligns with the narrative of conquest and conflict presented in the book. Point number two concerning the archaeology and historicity. Canaanite cities. Excavation in sites like Hazor, Jericho, and Ai have uncovered layers that suggest destruction, which evangelicals claim corresponds to the Israelite conquests 
described in Joshua and Judges. These findings support the idea of conflict between the Israelites and the Canaanite city-states. Point number three, urbanization from nomadic life. The transition from a nomadic lifestyle to settled agriculture can be seen through the material culture changes. This mirrors the cultural shifts described in Judges where the Israelites struggled to maintain their identity as they settled into Canaan. Point number four, iconography and religious practices discovered in the land. Artifacts related to religious practices, including figurines and cultic sites, provide context for the syncretism and idolatry that judges like Gideon and Samson confronted. This supports the book's depiction of Israel's spiritual struggles. Point number five, archaeology and historicity. Regional historicities. Comparison with other ancient Near Eastern texts and inscriptions may also lend contextual support to the events and societal issues addressed in Judges. For instance, the mention of the Philistines and their conflicts with Israel aligns with the historical understanding of the Canaanite presence during the Iron Age. Point number six, Hebrew tribal conflicts. Archaeologists have unearthed evidence of intertribal conflicts and alliances in ancient Israel, which reflect the divisions and the struggles detailed in the Book of the Judges. While these pieces of evidence do not conclusively validate every narrative in the Judges, they contribute to a broader understanding of the historical and cultural context of the period. Scholars often approach these findings with interpretations that vary from support for biblical narratives to views of historical evolution without direct correlation to the scriptures. Therefore, it's essential to consider archaeological findings as part of a larger conversation about ancient Israel's history and its depiction in biblical trends. So the bottom line to that those few paragraphs is that there is archaeological evidence that can be interpreted to support the historicity for the events of the book of Judges as being real. But if you're a skeptical, uh, stone-hearted uh, apostate, you could also find reasons to uh, interpret them in a more secular way. Well, let's look at the purpose and the theme of the book of Judges. The purpose, one, is the historical record. Judges serves as a historical narrative of Israel during the tumultuous period between the conquest of Canaan and the establishment of the monarchy. This was about a 400 year period and uh, this is consistent with what all kings and leaders of all ancient Near East civilizations did. They had a written record of the history of the events of their leadership. Point number two is moral and spiritual lessons. This point illustrates the consequences of Israel's disobedience to God, showcasing a cycle of sin, suffering, supplication, and salvation. Point number three is divine justice. The book highlights the faithfulness of God in raising leaders, called judges, to deliver Israel from oppression despite their recurring unfaithfulness. So that leads us into the main themes for the book of the Judges. And the most primary and most main theme of the book of Judges, which has echoes all throughout the history of humanity, we call the Deuteronomic cycle. The main theme of Judges is the, vivid, is the vividly portrayed and recurring 
Deuteronomic cycle, which details the stages in Israel's relationship with Yahweh. Pardon me. <coughs> now, this Deuteronomic cycle starts off with a good relationship between the people and Yahweh. Then, apathy and sin enter in. They receive a warning, judgment comes, and they cry out in repentance, to which Yahweh forgives them and delivers them. But the cycle repeats over and over and over again. In the book of the Judges, the cycle repeated at least 13 times over approximately 350 to 400 years. This is a cycle that is always active in human experience because of our sin-stained spirit, active right into today. It is just the way sin works in the human heart. See Ezekiel 36.26 Wherefore, I, Papa Dale, exhort us all to read and to do what it says in 2 Timothy 1.6 and in Psalm 103, 1-2, which I will leave you to look up and heed. Point number two, leadership and kingship. The judges represents a transitional leadership structure before the establishment of the monarchy in Israel. This emphasizes the need for righteous leadership. Point number three, social and moral decline. This theme is a narrative that re reveals a decline in morality and adherence to God's laws, culminating in the Israelites being described as, quote, they did what was right in their own eyes. Judges 21, 25. Theme number four is faithfulness to God. Despite Israel's rebellion, God's persistent faithfulness and willingness to respond to their cries for help is a significant theme. Theme number five, God's sovereignty. The judges' stories illustrate God's control over events in Israel's history. This demonstrates Yahweh's ability to raise leaders according to his will and purpose. And so overall, the book of Judges is a complex narrative that provides insight into Israelite society, theology, and the nature of God's relationship with his people during a challenging historical context. The main characters of the Book of the Judges, often referred to simply as Judges, and these folks play significant roles in each of the narratives throughout the book. Here are the main characters. Othniel, he was the first judge of Israel. Ehud, he was notable for his left-handedness. Shamgar, he's a lesser-known judge but is, was known to be brave and strong. Deborah, she was the only female judge, and she was also a prophetess. Barak, now Barak was a military leader who stood behind Deborah and supported her. Gideon, Gideon was just a simple farmer, but he was called by God to deliver Israel and became a great warrior. Jephthah, Jephthah was known for his tragic vow, because of which his daughter died. Samson. Samson is famous for his immense strength, his long hair, his Nazarite vow, and being betrayed by Delilah. And last, the last main character we'll mention is Abimelech, and he was the son of Gideon. Now, these judges illustrate the varied experiences and struggles faced by the Israelites during this period, and they demonstrate themes of leadership, faith, and the consequences both of obedience and disobedience to God. 
Well, the Book of the Judges has a distinct literary structure, and we can summarize that using the following ideas. The first part of the book, Judges 1, 1 through chapter 3, verse 6, is an introductory section which establishes the historical context after the death of Joshua, and it highlights Israel's failure to fully conquer the land. It includes a presentation of the tribes of Israel and their incomplete conquests, and this leads into a cycle of disobedience and oppression. Structural point number two, cycles of sin. Chapter 3, verse 7 through chapter 16, verse 31. The core of the book of Judges follows a repetitive pattern, which we've all already referenced, and again we'll reference it. It is known as the Deuteronomic cycle. It's also known as the cycle of the Judges. And this consists of, begins with apathy, but then the cycle proper consists of sin, warning, judgment, repentance, deliverance, restoration. This sin is represented through the stories involving the judges, including Othniel, Ehud, Deborah, Gideon, Jephthah, and Samson. So, structural point number three, concluding events, chapter 17, 1 through chapter 21, 25. The final episodes, the final chapters of the book of Judges, provide supplemental narratives that illustrate the moral and societal decline of Israel during this period. These stories include the account of Micah's idolatry, the Levite, and his concubine and the consequences of civil war against the tribe of Benjamin. These narratives emphasize the themes of chaos and moral ambiguity, concluding with a refrain that, quote, everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. Chapter 21, verse 25. This highlights the lack of centralized authority and moral direction in Israel. Now, overall, the structure of Judges represents a historical cycle of disobedience and deliverance interspersed with moral lessons and societal reflections. And this culminates in a narrative that underscores the need for righteous leadership and the consequences of turning away from God. So let's have a look at the storyline for the book of Judges. The narrative begins with the death of Joshua, and details how the Israelites repeatedly fell into a sin cycle. Initially, the Israelites adhered to Yahweh and the covenant, but over time, apathy towards Yahweh grew, and they lapsed into disobedience, which led to divine warnings and eventual judgment through oppression by neighboring nations. In response, the Israelites would cry out in repentance, prompting God to raise up judges, which were military leaders and prophets, to deliver them. Now, notable judges such as Deborah, Gideon, Jephthah, and Samson each brought Israel a temporary period of peace and prosperity. However, the cycle soon repeated as subsequent generations fell back into apathy and sin. And of course they were surrounded by the Canaanite people whom they had failed to totally and completely evict from the land as God had told them. The era of the judges is marked by moral and social decline. With the repeated refrain, everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. Judges 21-25. This indicates a lack of centralized leadership, and a breakdown of societal norms. Leadership during this time is divided into distinct periods, each characterized by that self-same cycle of sin, oppression, repentance, and deliverance. 
Each time Israel fell into sin, it was because of Canaanite women who led them away from their worship of Yahweh and into the worship of pagan gods, including participation in their immoral and evil worship practices, which often included sacrificing to these fake gods, orgiastic sexual encounters, uh, the sacrifice of babies and infants. It was ab absolutely putrid, absolutely disgusting. So let's look at some of the periods during the time of the judges. The leadership under Othniel, Judges 3, verses 7 through 11. The first judge, Othniel, delivers Israel from the oppression of Cushan Rithshiaim, the king of Aram. Ehud, Judges 3, Judges 3, verse 12 through 30, is known for his left-handedness. And Ehud delivers Israel from the Moabites, led by King Eglon, by assassinating him. Shamgar, Judges 3.31. Shamgar's brief history highlights his victory by his killing over 600 Philistines with an ox goad. Deborah, Judges chapters 4 and 5. She was a prophetess and judge. Deborah alongside Barak, leads Israel to defeat the Canaanite general Sisera. Then we see Gideon's in Judges 6 through 8. Gideon was just a humble farmer and initially is reluctant to lead. Eventually he does lead Israel against the Midianites, freeing them from oppression. Abimelech, Judges chapter 9. Abimelech is the son of Gideon, and he self-appoints as king in Shechem, but his rule ends in conflict and violence. Tola is the next judge. We see Tola's judgeship occurring in Judges chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. He followed Abimelech, and Tola provides Israel with 23 years of stability and peace. Oh, wasn't that nice? Then there was Jair, Judges 10, verses 3 through 5. Jair judges Israel for 22 years, and he also brought a period of prosperity. Wasn't that great? They had a reprieve from the effects of the sin and violence. Then we see Jephthah in Judges 10, 6 through Judges 12, 7. He's known for his tragic vow, because of which he sacrifices his own daughter. Jephthah delivers Israel from the Ammonites, but faces internal conflict. We also see the story of Ibzan, Judges 12, 8 through 10. Ibzan judges Israel for seven years, though little is detailed about his leadership. There is next Elon, Judges 12, 11 through 12. Elon judges Israel for 10 years, even though his story is just briefly noted. Abdon. Ab, you can see about Abdon in Judges 12, 13 through 15. He's known for having a very large family and great wealth, and he judges Israel for eight years. And the next judge we see is Samson. We see his events in uh, Judges chapters 13 through 16. Known for his supernatural strength, Samson struggles with personal moral weakness, but ultimately he delivers Israel from the Philistines. Now these judges served as both leaders and deliverers during times of crisis, contributing to the overarching narrative of the cycle of faithfulness, apostasy, restoration that defines the book of Judges. Now here are more details about two of the more famous accounts of these hero judges, the stories of Gideon and Samson. Now Gideon's story is found in Judges chapters 6 through 8. Israel 
was suffering under Midianite oppression where their crops and livestock were destroyed. The Israelites cried out to Yahweh for deliverance. An angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, a humble farmer, while he was threshing wheat in secret to hide it from the Midianites. The angel addressed him as a mighty warrior and informed him that God had chosen him to deliver Israel from Midian. Now Gideon, thinking of himself as just a farmer and not a mighty warrior, was hesitant and asked for signs to confirm God's calling. And so Yahweh first burned up a sacrifice offered by Gideon with fire that just flew from a rock. And later, he performed the fleece test, wherein Gideon asked for overnight dew, first only on the fleece and not on the ground, and then the reverse. God performed that miracle, and Gideon accepted the mantle of leadership. At first, Gideon assembled an army, but then Yahweh told him, Oh, that was too large. Through a series of reductions, Gideon ended up with just 300 men to fight an entire Midianite army of thousands. Well, God told them to put lit torches inside clay jars, and then the 300 men snuck into and dispersed throughout the Midian camp at night, very dark, dark night, out in the desert. And at a prearranged signal, simultaneously, the, the Israelite soldiers broke their jars and blew loudly on trumpets. The Midianites were awakened by the surprise of multiple lights and a great cacophony of sound, and this created great panic and confusion among the Midianites, who began to slaughter each other from fear. This led to a great Israelite victory, without much direct personal combat even. Well, the people wanted to take Gideon and make him their king, but Despite the victory, Gideon refused, stating that Yahweh should rule over Israel. However, he did make for himself a gold-embroidered celebratory ephod. Now, an ephod was an apron-like garment covering from the front of a person, from the neck to the toes, and, it, and the one that Gideon had made was from the gold taken from the Midianites. But it became a snare for Israel, as it became an idol, and they worshipped it. Well, Samson's story is detailed in Judges, chapters 13 through 16. Samson was a Nazarite set apart by God to deliver Israel from the Philistines who were oppressing them at the time. Samson's birth was foretold by an angel to his parents, who were previously childless. He was to be a Nazarite, abstaining from strong drink, not cutting his hair, and avoiding dead bodies. Samson, ex Samson exhibited extraordinary strength, performing great feats, such as killing a lion with his bare hands, and defeating 30 Philistines in one battle, and carrying away the gates of Gaza on his back. Well, Samson fell in love with Delilah, who was a Philistine woman, and she was bribed by her countrymen to discover the secret of Samson's great strength. After several attempts, she succeeded by coaxing him into revealing that his strength lay in his uncut hair. Not the fact that his hair was uncut, but his strength was Yahweh honoring his vow as a Nazarite, part of which was he didn't cut his hair. And so Delilah had Samson's hair cut while he slept. This led to his capture by the Philistines. 
and they gouged out his eyes and imprisoned him. But in his final act in life, Samson prayed to God for strength one last time. And then he brought down the temple of the Philistine god Dagon. In the process, he killed himself, but he also killed many Philistines as well. Now these stories highlight themes of divine intervention, faithfulness, and the consequences of both obedience and disobedience to God's commands. The book of the Judges concludes with accounts of civil strife and violence, further illustrating the moral and spiritual decay of Israel during this period. Well, so that's it for the book of Judges. I'm your old pal, Papa Dale, and this is the year 2024. This lecture has been the book of Judges, part one of three. And if you learned something, I hope you learned something. But uh, whether you did or whether you didn't, greater insights leading to a deeper relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ await you if you'll only keep going. Please remember to read the printed notes and look up the scripture citations if you're studying for the Bachelor of Arts in Biblical Literature degree. Now you can find these notes in the video transcript or at the link below in the Jan Hus Institute blog. Until I see you in the next video, this is your old pal Papa Dale saying so long for now and I'll be praying for you that you will be well and that you will be blessed. Ha, ha, ha.